everything starts from the, the contract. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running an architectural practice that helps you do your best work more often. As you know, on the show here, we bring on leading architects. We bring on architects that you haven't heard of before. We, we bring on consultants, thought leaders, and of course, we produce a lot of content here ourselves around this idea of capturing value in the marketplace and about the value of architecture and what architects provide. And I'm super excited to be joined here today by the co-founders of Windsor Patania Architects, who are located in the UK. They're going to tell us more about what their practice is up to. We have Giovanni on the line as well as Ryan. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. Hello listeners, we hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Giovanni and Ryan, welcome. Thanks, Enoch. Thanks, Enoch. You look excited. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, hey, tell us just to set set the stage. I'm going to set a little bit of stage here for our listeners that are listening. Uh, your practice recently, like all practices, you've you've done a lot of hard work. We had a little bit of conversation before we we started recording here, and just from what I picked up, I can tell that you're both uh, you're both passionate. You have your sleeves up. You're you're working hard. You're really pushing yourselves to provide an excellent product to your client in terms of design, in terms of architecture. Uh, so. That's sort of the unseen story a lot of times about architectural practices is all the blood, sweat, and tears that we've gone through to get us to where we are today. And you've had some pretty impressive and some really great breakthrough projects recently that we're going to talk about. And so I'm glad that we get to share your journey, what you've had, how you came about this. Uh, recently, though, you had two projects that you said that would be interesting to talk about here on the podcast. Number one is an XR lab which is an augmented reality facility that was commissioned by a university. Uh, I look forward to hearing more about that. And the second one is um, a very interesting sustainable villa that you mentioned that would be interesting to talk about. Now, these projects don't happen by accident, so I'd like to rewind a little bit, and I'd just like to ask you how this partnership came about because, Ryan, you mentioned to me you're not an architect. Giovanni, you are an architect, and... Tell us, how did you guys join forces? And Ryan, if you're not an architect, why the heck are you working in an architectural practice? <laughs> That's a good question. That is a good question, Enoch. Um, so uh, maybe I maybe I can start. So I'm definitely I'm definitely not an architect. I don't touch any of the the designs. I do um, advise and consult on the projects, but more from a development side. So my background is in developments and investing, both personally and through other companies. Um, I've actually sat on a few um, national charity boards as a trustee to help them with their investment strategies. And um, we, we met, um, me and Giovanni met, uh, you know, in London uh, at an award ceremony. I was getting an award for uh, doing some things in, in property. Um, and uh, he come and grabbed me to, to have a chat after I, I gave my speech. So yeah. I'm going to pause you right there just for a second, Ryan. Yeah. How does someone like yourself get into that career path? We're familiar with how architects mm. get to where we are, but how yeah. does someone get into the development investment path? Uh, are you familiar with a TV show called Homes Under the Hammer in the UK? I'm not. Please tell me about it. Give it's, me the short. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a show about people going to auctions, buying property, and they follow the journey for them to flip the property, sell it for a profit, or, or rent it out. So I, I got inspired by this program and I, I started actually investing when I was 17, 18. Um, I couldn't get a mortgage, so I had to work with family, family basically to, to join, them, join forces with them. Learned some hard lessons on overspending on projects, 
uh, you know, uh, and um, yeah, um, I, I've been doing that since, you know, so 16 years later, I've, I've built up a portfolio of, of properties and uh, yeah, advised for other companies as well. So when you said you, so at 16, 17 years old, you didn't have a lot of funds to invest yourself. Do you remember how much did you raise for the first project that you did? I'm curious how that happened. This was um, this this was a few years ago, so numbers are going to be different than today. Um, so this was the crash. So um, I f I was living in an area of the country um, called Norfolk, so a more rural part of the country, small town, and house prices dropped by forty percent. Um, and I thought to myself, okay that's actually valuable, right? You know, that that's actually creating value, value there. So you're buying it a lot cheaper. Rents were relatively good for the area, for the price. Um, and um, I had saved up from childhood businesses, ch childhood business ventures, 6,250 pounds, yeah? And that was the price I negotiated for a 10% deposit on, on the property. So the property that I was buying or bought in the end was 62,500. And at that time, I could get a 10% mortgage. So I put that down, my life savings. It was quite a stressful time, as you can imagine. I didn't know if it was going to work out, but I, I thought it would. Interest rates were very high, like they are today. So profit wasn't there, but I thought this would be a good pension pot for myself. Um, and um, yeah, five years later, I remortgaged on a much cheaper rate when rates came down. And um, yeah, that's uh, how I got started in, in property, really. That's, I mean, that that's... So it sounds impressive for someone of that age, 16 to 17. Most of us are, you know, chasing girls and going to the video game store and you're investing in properties. That's great. <laughs> Love yeah, it. I, was, I was a bit of a, a strange kid. Yeah, I you guess you were strange, you say yeah. That. yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. And what was it, Ryan, that caused you to go, or, or I guess let's go this way. Giov Giovanni, why did you, uh, Ryan spoke at this event where he was getting an award. What was it that made you want to go uh, meet Ryan? So I, at a time, that was back in 2015 or 16, yeah, I um, was in a full networking mode, right? So I was running my own event for developers in central London, which was called Holborn Property Meet, right? That was a side gig I was uh, doing uh, while I was working at Foster & Partners. So during the day, Arcade Foster & Partner. Foster and Partners during the night, I was doing these uh, events for developers, which because I was really passionate about exploring another side of uh, architecture. The, so what's behind architecture, you know, the numbers, the developments, the developers in general, right? So I was getting passionate about uh, this development world, this investment world, right? This is why I started expanding my network in this direction. And uh, that night um, at the Strand Hotel, I believe, Ryan? Savoy. Uh, the Savoy, Savoy. sorry. The, 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 boy, the, the Strand was the location. Savoy was the hotel. Um, uh, yes, it was like a, a black tie event, tuxedo, you know, like just Bond, James, James Bond movies, yeah. Um, I just heard his, uh, his talk, um, uh, acceptance speech for the for the word and uh, I just uh, thought you know I should speak with this guy you know I like the way he speaks I like the way the way uh, he was humble he, he was coming across humble as well and uh, so we started chatting and um, yes he told me his story I told him my story working for um, Foster and Partners with his Apple stores so uh, my my role was mainly in, in a team which was working for Apple stores. I also uh, been leading the design of the Champs-Élysées Apple store in Paris, which was completed in 2019. So all really cool projects. Uh, but I just felt that my sort of uh, career wasn't in, into a corporate. So I wanted to start my own thing. And I wasn't sure that that thing was architecture, another architectural practice. I was m going more in the direction of property property investing as well. I also have my portfolio of properties, which I started in 2017. Um, so we started speaking and then um, it didn't happen on that night. He didn't ask me, uh, do you want to open up an architectural practice that <laughs> night, right? <laughs> uh, but it, it took a few months because I invited <laughs> him to my networking event and that's the power of the networking events, right? 
you can invite whoever you want to your networking event and you are the, the sort of the, um, the opinion leader you are the reference point of the event right so so um, you are reference point and and you have the power to invite whoever you want for how many times you want to be the relationships right so I started inviting Ryan um, asking him to, to share about his property journey you know at the time we had like 50 60 people in the room so Ryan Windsor, uh, please uh, welcome Ryan Windsor. A round of applause. Hey, hey, hey. And uh, he was sharing his story, right? And then after months and months, you know, obviously we got close to each other's. I he called me to visit one of the properties he was planning to buy. That was in Thetford, still Norfolk. Yeah. There was he wanted to convert this this uh, former council building or something like that uh, into a block of flats, right? So uh, he needed uh, an architect to go and uh, tell him, you know, uh, if it was possible in the first place. So I went and um, it happened that I uh, uh, was with an estate agent, uh, which was showing me around. And that, that day, basically, you know, I was like, I asked the estate agent, can I go into the loft? Is it safe? He said, yes. I went into the loft and it happened that the floor collapsed when I was <laughs> ex uh, expecting the, the loft and I fell through the, the loft, right? I left a big hole in the ceiling, right? So I came out all plenty of dust in front of the state agent and the state agent was paralyzed by terror, <laughs> right? Paralyzed, you know, I didn't, I mean, I, I didn't know what to say. I was like, uh, he was like, all good? I said, yes, all good. <laughs> in, <laughs> it was a really weird moment. Um, we it was plenty of dust, and then we, we left the building. And the the the, the following day, his his company sent over an email asking for to pay them damage. Right. So Ryan was really nice because uh, he he jumped in and he basically protect uh, myself. At the time, he didn't know anything about these viewings how they were working and who was responsible for what. And basically he said, you know, actually you agent, you should have that duty of care, right? So it's your responsibility if he didn't, you know, he, he left the, the, the hole in the ceiling. And that moment was actually the moment where really we started bonding with each other, with each other's, right? To the point that um, I went to his, his uh, future uh, family house. I did a sketch for you, for, for, for him, for without charging anything. We had a dinner together, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was one a really day, good dinner. It was a really good, really dinner. good, really good dinner at the a sushi restaurant. Yeah. yeah, they really treated me well that night. And one day, you know, uh, I was sitting at the Vauxhall bus station in, in Vauxhall, and um, in in London, sorry, in London, and I get I get this message from him on, on WhatsApp, you know, and it was like, you know, do you want to start an architectural practice together? Yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I said yes, and so everything started from there. And um, at the beginning, we got like one client in the first six months, right? And then it took off really, really slowly, right? Yeah, and um, but it, we quickly realized that the partnership was working out because, uh, as as we know, right, when you are when you go into a partnership, one plus one must make three, not two, right? So it means, you know, the, the two partners, they really need to bring a lot of value yeah. to each other's. Um, so uh, the fact that he was, he is a completely different, um, he has a dif completely different skill set than mine is, is fantastic. Uh, so we say that, you know, he's a, he's a business person right property developer but also he has a fantastic sale uh, skill set yeah he's a fantastic salesman right talks a lot to maybe too much sometimes <laughs> i'm being very quiet now <laughs> and uh and he's fantastic with clients so we say that basically he fishes the fish and i fry the fish this is how you know we we build, structured our partnership and this is how we actually we basically successfully built the company so far. Wonderful. So it started at a sushi restaurant, and you're still frying and catching fish. I love it. I love yeah. it. But it's easy. It's easy to you know talk to clients 
if you believe in the in, in the product and the service, right? You know, and and Giovanni didn't mention this, but you know, in between our courtship, if you will, to go into business together, I had a consultancy helping people invest in property and giving them guidance. Um, and um, a lot of the time, I refer had to refer them to other experts because I was very clear with them. I'm not. X, Y, Z. I, I know my stuff, I've got experience, but I, I can't give you architectural or planning advice to the level as a qualified professional. And uh, when I met Giovanni, I started to refer clients to him and they all came back and they said, he is the best architect I have ever worked with. He is great at communication, great designs. He thinks outside the box. You know, he's, he's not just thinking about the thing that's in front of him. He's thinking about the next problems that could occur and already bringing solutions to the table and I thought well actually that's a really nice way to consult you know like you're at, the, an architect is actually creating things and then you can actually see the building whereas I just give the advice so I said why don't you know why don't we merge that that was my idea so you know we're, we're a very commercially minded practice and I think our, our clients appreciate that mm. and you said during the first six months it was a real struggle what did you do during those first six months to bring in projects Talk to a lot of people. Yeah, what did that look like when you say talk to a lot of people? Tell me. Uh, I think it was going through my contact list and tell, just telling them, raising awareness of you know what we're doing. You know, uh, I'm moving away from just pure consultancy to actually offering a, a service, an architectural design service, and promoting Giovanni um, and what what we could do together, um, and then seeing if they had any contacts who would be interested you know sometimes they weren't interested at all but at least they knew about it now and again following up like following up with these people and making sure uh they would advocate for us because you know we've given them i've given them advice or helped them in the past and how long did it take what was the first really substantial project that you got after that process of reaching out to the network and talking to so many people so we uh, things really took off when we started working with a building team, and they basically uh, started referring us uh, a lot of clients. So, uh, and when you they, say a building team, you mean uh, a construction company? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they they were specialized in working for developers in um, around London, but mainly in the northwest, so Liverpool and Manchester. So we started getting a lot of projects over there to the point that I moved to Liverpool for two years and I lived in Liverpool for two years to consolidate our sort of um, uh, presence in the area. Yeah. So the, the spike of, of, of in project, the, the first spike in project, which really gave us the, the boost to set the foundation of the practice was via this building team. Yeah. I'm curious, so from the beginning, even up until now, what, what is the company viewpoint on profit? How do you all see profit and tying that back into the business and architecture? What's your philosophy on profit as an architectural practice? Like any business, you, you need a surplus, you need a profit, right? Uh, it's important. It gives us sustainability to, to take risks, to, to hire new people, to, to try and do something new, obviously spend it on intangibles like marketing, you know. Um, and I, I would say for me, uh, this really hit home actually during COVID. Um, so we didn't, uh, we had profit in the business and we felt quite comfortable not having to even consider letting any of our team members go because we had that financial security. Um, and I think, you know, some people say that you need like three or six months operating capital. And I said to Gio, that's rubbish. We need two years, right? And that might be too much, but at, at the time of COVID, that seemed like the right amount to have. Um, and we, we've gone through a really, we go through a really tough in interview process with our team. Um, you know, it's not just a, a general chat and then they're hired, they have to do tests. You know, we really need this cultural fit. So, you know, that might take a month or two to, to really like find that, that one person once we've shortlisted. And then I was thinking the worst thing that could happen is if we have to fire these people that have entrusted their, their careers to us because we don't have the money to, to keep them, right? You know, and COVID was a, a unique situation, but I, I just think that sort of set the groundwork of actually we need to get in projects that give us a profit so we can it benefits the company and obviously our, our team. 
And what are the steps that you take to ensure that that profit is there? What are the key lever points that you're looking at to make sure that it is profitable? Everything starts from the, the contract, right? So um, we quantify how many hours it's going to take on the project. You know, sometimes we use the debt as a, as a measure, the amount of hours we believe it's going to take and how much we get paid per hour. And sometimes we use a percentage of the construction cost. Um, so uh, rarely we use uh, like fixed fees. Um, but in general, we like to leave um, uh, a good gap in between our expenses and uh, and the income you receive to avoid having um, ha- having basically to work for non profit, right? And uh, that's why actually we are f- uh, faced with you know clients which uh, wish we were charging less, <laughs> and they. Um, they actually decide to go for um, service providers which are charging really little, yeah, in comparison to what what is appropriated for the job, right? Uh, to the point that sometimes they hire also architect, uh, other professionals which don't have maybe the right insurance cover or things like that, right? They take some risk. Um, so as you know, in in England, um, uh, there is a little bit of a perfect. Sp- perfect storm in, in a sense that there is a high inflation, high uh, interest rates, construction cost is, is skyrocketing, um, there is lack of labor, at, you know, affordable labor from the from Europe because now um, I believe there's already um, a regulation around the minimum salary to be, um, to have the visa, the working visa in England, which is now 38,000 pounds before used to be 26,000 pounds. So less, um, so uh, a shortage of lorry drivers, shortage of labor for construction sites, everything driven, drove the construction costs up. So perfect storm in that sense. So in mm, what we see is that um, developers are, and even homeowners are, are trying to save uh, part of their budget by uh, hiring service providers which are obviously charging much less and they are willing to take a risk uh, with that yeah as long as they they reduce the budget for the services um, at the moment we didn't have the need to lower down our prices uh, because obviously we don't want to flood our team with too many projects to overwork them um, we tend to to choose you know cherry pick those projects which are still meeting these requirements and um, and and uh, and we 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 we're trying to keep these strategy as the standard also for the rest of the year. Excellent. So, all right. So, and before we hopped on the the, we had a little bit of pre talk before the podcast, and and uh, we don't want to sugarcoat this. This is a real, this is a real mm, obstacle in in the industry, not just in the UK, but also here in in the United States, which is architects, our fellows. Our colleagues who are willing to drop their fees so low, undercut, and 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 you gentlemen know like are from your knowledge like how are these other practices doing it? Where are they cutting back? Because we know they have to be cutting back somewhere. Are they just not making money? Are they are they living like paupers themselves? Are they giving not as good scope in terms of the projects? Are they, what's what's going on here? When it comes down to reducing price, uh, obviously, uh, there's also another way to reduce price, which is reduce the scope of works, right? So you reduce the quality, you reduce the, you know, the amount of service you provide, less meetings, less design revisions, right? But then you start really hitting into your sort of profit (laughs) and uh, there's no way around it, right? So, uh, uh, some practices um, might decide to break even as long as they retain the client and they keep the client in the long term. That can be another strategy, right? Um, it's a strategic strategic decision based on the fact that, that that client might bring more projects in the future, right? Um, 
So this is my my point of view. Ryan, do you have any any other idea of that? I mean, it's it's, it's tough, isn't it? I mean, we've we've seen it in um, recent news. You know, some big name companies they have just not been making enough. They've probably been underbidding on the projects. They've been successful in winning them. They've been done, doing some very prestigious projects. Um, but, you know, there's news literally every month of a, of a big name architectural practice, you know, in the UK that has uh, filed for bankruptcy or closed, right? You know, it's not where we want to be. Um, you don't so want to be th- bankrupt and closed, Ryan? What's, definitely. Tell no, me about that. No, that, I don't think that was in our strategic plan at all. No. <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's not your strategic plan. Your growth plan. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> it's the anti-growth plan. The right? anti-growth yeah. plan. Um, yeah, I definitely not. I I, th- I think you know it's, it's it's better to have solid foundations and maybe you know grow a little bit more sustainably than take on too much and yeah. do it at the at the peril of of other other things, right? Well, good on both of you for drawing a line in the stand and taking a stand. Because that's what we're about here in Business of Architecture. Say, let's take a stand. Let's stop devaluing what architects do. And I'm, I, I understand it because having practiced full-time as an architect, I know what it's like to sit across from the table mm-hmm. from a client who's telling us that their budget only goes so far that they want to take out of the architectural services that they're trying to talk down the fees on the services side. From both of your perspective, I'd like to know, what do you think it is that causes us architects to be so, and I know it happens in other professions too, but maybe just not as architects, but as humans, to devalue our own value instead of standing for it powerfully? It's a fantastic question. I mean, I've been asking myself this question since the university, so uh, because it's not a problem of today, right? It has always been the sort of... Uh, a trait of the architects in general. Uh, I feel that is because architects, I mean, we are really passionate about our job. It's a creative job. Uh, and uh, we end up overworking, you know, and thinking about the aesthetics, the functionalities, we get really into it. And um, the artistic sort of approach that we exercise on in this profession uh, doesn't play a, a great role in, uh, in in seeing the profession as a business sometimes right um, yeah. if we were uh, if the education system would provide a better uh, business culture to the arch- architects maybe we will see less of these of these problems uh, in relation to our fees in general and also working over time is a is a is a another problem which has, is associated to the, prof- to the profession if you speak with a lawyer and you know they even calculate the minutes they're working for you and they make you pay every single minutes minutes extra right if you ask a client of an actual practice to pay you additional money for every minute you're working they have they're gonna have a laugh right <laughs> so uh, it's difficult to convince them to pay an architect for additional hours they are working um, so it's, uh, yeah. it's kind of a culture around the profession. It's like, you know, musicians, you know, um, why should I pay you? You like, you know, you, you, what you're doing is like a, a passion, right? Why should I pay you a lot of money? And the same with the, with the architect, you know, they, people think architects are there to draw and do wonderful buildings because they love it. Hence, they should be paid less. It's a cultural thing. Yeah. I would say, I mean, just as, I mean, if we summarize, yeah, you know, it's, I think it's because we care. We care maybe too much, you know, especially when the project is a, a special project and it has some meaning. Uh, you know, we want to go that extra mile, even if the client doesn't have the budget, you know, we tend to want to just see it through. Ryan, from your, yeah, from your perspective, why is this happening in the industry as an outsider? When you look with a business perspective looking in, at the design industry, why do we why do we undervalue ourselves? Why are we so willing to drop our pants to any <laughs> client that asks us to be architectural whores, so to speak, for <laughs> the entire world? I, I, again, I think it's maybe it's uh, you know the the pro- some of these projects are like our babies, right? And we just want to see them grow up and to be finished. And uh, clients know that uh, they know it's important for us to be involved in the whole process. 
Um, we've been going through some uh, some nice projects at the moment where we've designed something fantastic and then they say thank you very much we're going to stop your services and then go to builders to see if the builders want to hire you now yeah you know and it's kind of like wow really you know uh, we might not be involved in seeing this to fruition uh, so then you know when the builders come you know you might be more willing to uh, discount right you know or you know just psychologically right because you want to the project con to continue it's tough, um, but I think it's because we care. We care and we want the project to go well. And you know, some of these professions, Giovanni mentioned, you know, maybe lawyers, uh, or maybe it's being a bit harsh on them. Um, I mean, they, like let's to... face, they don't care. They're just in it for the money. I'll, I'll take the flag for all the baristas out there. <laughs> I, was gonna, I, was gonna, I, was, I was gonna say, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe we uh, stereotype a bit, but um, you know, th those professions might be seen as more like cold and calculated. Where Certainly. I think, you know, we're a more warm profession. Certainly. Okay. Gentlemen, so we have about 10 more minutes for the episode. And I'd love yeah. to hear about these two innovative projects that you recently pulled off that are quite interesting. Um, so if we can maybe spend about five minutes on each or whatever the budget allows for that, uh, who would like to sure. tell us yeah. about project number one? So um, with, uh, with XR Lab, the Extended Reality Lab, is a project we did for um, the Eastern Education Group in Norfolk. They are um, a group of colleges and universities based in Norfolk, which is nearby Cambridge. Um, so they had this uh, hangar building, which they were using uh, for different activities. And they basically pick up one of the five hangars of the building, which they were using as, as a- um, Automotive a school automotive school, a workshop. Uh, so it, when we stepped into that building, that hangar for the first time, it was like greasy, you know, with all these engines all over the place, uh, the ceiling falling apart. <laughs> and um, they invited us to basically tender for um, the design and, and the construction support for uh, this inno innovative augmented reality facility a research lab for deploying uh, the latest technology in relation to um, virtual reality, AI, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, the topic, the basic theme was to create the, the future space of education um, uh, for for students to learn via via augmented reality. That was the the topic. So we tendered. Um, we actually um, won the bid against an AJ100 company, Big Everard. I think they have, you know, around 100 architects or something like that. So we've been quite, you know, strong in that com competing for that project. Uh, Two million pounds construction cost, uh, funded by the government, and um, it was really cool because uh, the the principal of the of the university had. Uh, a really clear idea of what he wanted. He wanted um, uh, a building looking like a spacecraft landed into a hangar, right? And so we got, we, we got really excited. He, he said, you know, I want people to walk in into the hangar and say, wow, what the hell is that? Yeah. And then they were entering the building and finding out another, a new way of learning, a new space, the future of education. So this was a fantastic brief coming from a client, right? And we have to reinterpret the reef and turn it into an architecture, okay? So, and we did it successfully. We've been praised. Um, it, we got the um, uh, education department, government department coming over to open for the opening ceremony. Uh, so um, it has been a success. So how did we got to this success? How, do, how did we get to this, this success was via you know, really pushing with this vision, right, uh, of uh, of the spacecraft, right. So we took some inspiration from the monolith of of uh, uh, two thousand and one Space Odyssey, from Tesla, the Cybertruck to design the exteriors of the building. So if you look at the the two um, feature walls of the pod inside the hangar, they look like the um, uh, the shape of the Cybertruck with a sort of a triangular mesh, which remember. Um, connects visually with the virtual environments, right? So a lot of people are taking pictures around uh, on the side of the wall, you know, it's the Instagram moment. Uh, we did a lot of interviews with these kind of 
um, uh, really cool uh, um, feature wall. And then when you go inside, we chose a uh, black and white uh, color palette, taking inspiration from Men in Black. So we really wanted like the students to feel like they were protagonists of the future of education. So like Men in Blacks, they were you know entering the inside of the building and finding a new world, a secret world with uh, all these um, uh, augmented reality headsets on the walls. They were wearing them putting them, them on and then they were ready for action to learn by manipulating objects in 3D and doing group activities in 3D uh, environments. Um, one of the main things that we're doing was like working with uh, 3D engines um, of airplanes, of cars, and manipulating them with uh, these, these active gloves and, uh, and, 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 and special uh, suits. So um, altogether, you know, uh, created this this really cool space, which uh, you know has, has been praised by by university and and the client overall. So the, the overall project was designed and built in um, in nine months, so really really fast turnaround, on time and on budget. Yeah. What was what was the most? Uh, what do you think it was that that allowed you guys to to win that project? Would you say? We were the right architects at, uh, at the right time, I would say, because uh, basically what happened is that there was a, a really um, short window of time during which we had to produce a concept to show them to show to show, to show the, the client that we were understanding their vision, and um, so we did. We basically put together a concept within this window of time, and. Um, we just convinced them to to hire us. When 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 we asked the question to the to the to the educator to the university, you know why they they basically said, you know, we know what our current kind of architect does, and it's okay. But for this project, it needs to be a flagship. It needs to be the beacon of of our college. Now we're going to change education. This the the principle of this 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 college here is. A visionary you know and uh, you know you see what he's doing he's doing some really really great things and uh, he needed the, the building and the architecture to reflect that so again Giovanni's been quite humble and I think the other people that were bidding for it they just put like a quick sketch together you know 2d we 3d modeled the space and we worked in CGI our team worked a lot very in a very short of space of time like a week and we built out like a full concept and pretty much what we had built looked like the original concepts which they were quite amazed on because they know that doesn't always happen and they said we got exactly what we what we wanted from you guys right so i think that helped in uh, with the confidence you, you know using the cgis fascinating how does it how does like how does it feel to pull off that project i mean there's you talked about awards you talked about you on time and on budget like how does that feel amazing i mean it's it, gotta feel great it, it, it's why you start this profession in the first place i mean yeah, is uh that's you want 10 of those every year ideally <laughs> yeah. well even better though because you can see the real impact it's having you know you go back and you you speak to the the team at the the college you see the students learning you see what yeah. they're doing it, the, it's really great they, re, they recently did that uh, documentary on bbc as well so you can look and find it on bbc okay amazing yeah. Great. So our listeners can go there, check it out. It's a great project to go look at. Obviously, you can go to the uh, um, Windsor Patania's website. Uh, they have videos on there, video interviews, and it, it's pretty pretty fun. So tell us about, there's another project. We only have time for one more, but we'd love to hear about this this villa that, that Ryan, you're very excited about it because you mentioned it earlier. Who wants to tell us about this project? Maybe maybe I can I yeah, can start and Gio can yeah. can jump in. So I mean, um, just to give you a background, so the client of the villa, and this is a pretty special villa, um, is a client is an investor. He's a developer, um, and um, I had been speaking to him for a number of months, and you know nothing really took off, and he finally said, okay, I have a problem project. I've I've had two or three architects work on it for two or three years. I've had planning consultants. I need to make it bigger and better. It's a central London uh, commercial building. Um, I, I, I want to give you a go. So we said, okay, well, we actually, most of our projects that we get given are like the complex projects, right? You know, that we have to get 
through planning or something and we we, we seem to seem to thrive on those types of projects um, so he gave us this project and we we got more out of the project we got it approved everything all done in six months and he said okay now I'm going to give you another one another problem project we got um, again a great result through planning very quickly he said again I wish I found you two years ago that's what I want to hear from the clients right you know so um, you know that's kind of like what we're proud of and I guess he thought I'm going to give these guys a chance now you know um, so he said I'm buying a piece of land in a prestigious part of London Ascot um, and I want to build a, con a contemporary villa but I want a big villa Right, not the biggest villa, but I want it to be big enough to house all of the sustainable elements. And at the end, I want this to be one of, if not one of the most sustainable properties in the UK. And you know, uh, obviously, if you, you know, some people might say, well, just go and live in a seventy square meter house in the woods. That's pretty sustainable. But he wanted it to be a luxury villa, etc. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we've been working on this project for a, a few years now. Uh, lots of challenges, negotiations with the council. And uh, I think, Geo, you can confirm that we finally got planning planning permission just recently. We're we quite close to it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we got uh, one planning permission. We're looking for another one now. Yes, yeah. What yeah. we got was, uh, is a, is was a great. It's a quite but... complex process <laughs> because we are in the green belt there. So in the green belt, it is really complex to build, especially if you're trying to build a building which is larger than uh, the average of the buildings. You have to go through a, a lot of different planning applications to basic, to get your final um desired um result yeah incredible and, anything and, uh, go ahead yeah i mean yeah i mean in, in terms of the building itself it has 112 uh, solar panels on the roof uh so it runs uh, mostly on uh, solar power with um heat pumps as well um so it basically it generates more energy than it produces and um, and also thanks to the materials we are deploying, it's going to be a, a zero carbon project as well. So that's the target. Is one of this one here is one of those projects where the client also want to um, to basically plant trees as part of the overall scheme, just to bring back to the environment and emphasize the the overall uh, eco friendliness of the of the project. What's next? Where's the practice headed? What are, what are your plans and goals? Where would you like to take this vision? I mean, we, we want to 10x it, really. I mean, we want to 10x the number of projects of this type we are having. Uh, we don't want to, I, will, I mean, we want to have um, a team which is more experienced. So we want to hire people which are, you know, bringing a lot of experience on board. And um, we want to make the difference um, in terms of sustainable design and also high-tech uh, projects like the XR Lab. We, we got into um, uh, wet labs design as well. We're getting into designing labs for science. We did a few concepts, so it's another space we want to expand. And we're also starting working in, um, in uh, sustainable substations, which is another big topic in, uh, in, London, in the London area. Mm. So we, we partner with the engineers for the design of, of uh, substations, which, um, I mean, they don't look great. They are they're kind of uh, they are really what bulky, they are. bulky buildings, but as far as the engineers say, they save a lot of energy. So um, we, are, we, we like to be involved also in those projects um, in terms of providing, you know, technical knowledge. Beautiful. Well, gentlemen, thank you for being on here today. I think this is a great example of what can happen when you pair up a business mind uh, with architecture and design. And literally, we have two minds here coming from both worlds uh, building this practice. So appreciate you coming on, sharing with us. We'd love to have you back on the Business of Architecture podcast in the future to catch up. But I know there's a lot of lessons our listeners can learn here from networking, creating a networking event yourself, uh, to how to price projects. You know, I love what you said, Giovanni, that it starts with the contract. The profit starts with the contract. Yep. Uh, excellent. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks Thank for having us, Nick. Thank you, Nick. And that's a wrap. Oh, yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show.
This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.